It's almost Hanukkah, so we want to discuss Agyoni Aloha for Hanukkah, but the only thing I have the following challenge. We started a paragraph, so to speak, last time about Hesse Hadas and Tefillin, and I'd like to finish it. And I'll tell you why, because if we don't finish that, then we might not be able to pick it up. You know, if all these weeks will go by and we don't remember what we learned, it could be very much of a challenge. So what I'd like to do is spend about 10 minutes just finishing up what we started last time. And that would be on page 188. That's where we left off. And then... We'll start Hanukkah, Mirza Shem, which you'll see in the pages that David sent out on page 39. There was a machlokis between the Rambam on the one hand and the Rush on the other hand. So it's it, if you line up the Shittas, it's the Rambam and the Ramban against the Rush and Rabbi Yona. And the question is, to what extent does a person have to be aware of the fact that he's wearing tefillin as a constant awareness? And here we have two shitos. On the one hand, we have Rabbi Yona that says that Hese Hadas, which is prohibited, is defined as Chok V'Kalus Rosh. Whereas the Ramah and the Ramban say that Hesech Hadas means just if he doesn't have an awareness of his tefillin. We pointed out last time, if you recall, that what does it mean, awareness of his tefillin? He's wearing his tefillin. He's davening. He's learning. Whatever he's doing. But there's some sort of a latent awareness of his tefillin. And that's enough in order to fulfill the mitzvah of tefillin. But when I say that's enough, that demands a lot. See, according to Rabbi Yona, as long as you don't have some sort of negative kavanah, we'll call it an akira, with an eye and an akira, of schok v'kalus rosh, you're in that middle area, then you're okay. You fulfilled your mitzvah tefillin and you didn't have a hesech hadas. But you don't require a positive awareness of the tefillin on a constant basis. Whereas according to the Rambam and the Ramban, I have to be constantly tuned in to my tefillin. And then Afkamina would be, if let's say you had a middle kind of kavana. As we mentioned last time, you know, he was thinking about the, what is it called, the Toronto Blue Jays? I don't even remember the name of the teams anymore. And, uh, you know, he was thinking about the soccer game. He was thinking about perhaps a, an exam that he has to take. He wasn't uh, jumping around with Schok and Kalus Rosh. He wasn't thinking about things that he shouldn't be thinking about. And yet, according to the Ram and the Ramban, he does not fulfill the mitzvah of tefillin if he's distracted in any sort of a way because we require positive focus on the tefillin. But Ben Yon is a whole different story. Ben Yon is not requiring a constant awareness of the tefillin in a positive sense, but rather to exclude any negative kavanos which are antithetical to tefillin. But you could have a whole bunch of kavanos which although it's not a an, an awareness of tefillin, but it's not antithetical to tefillin. It's, it's just in that pa, in that parva area in the middle. In, in Hasidus, it's called the klipas noga, if anybody has ever heard of that term. It's neither milchiks nor fleshiks, you know, it's, it's parva. And here on page 188, the Hegyoni Halacha has a shtikl Torah from the Amek Bracha. Now, let me just give you a, a little bit of background. The Amik Bracha was one of those outstanding Talmidim of the Brisker Rav. His name was Pomeranchik. And I appreciate his works very much. But this particular work, this particular quote, I should say, it just baffles my mind. I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to unravel it. 
And I'm going to need your help. I'm going to sort of bounce off you what I think might be shot in this Amic Bracha. And we'll see if we could work it out. His question is based on one of the Rishonim, Rabbeinu Simcha. Rabbeinu Simcha writes in Hilchus Avel, Perik Dalit, I'm sorry, in Hilchus Tfilin, Perik Dalit Halacha Yud Gimel, that maybe we'll read it inside. That he doesn't understand how you could be Makai in the midst of Tefillin and at the same time recite Kriyachma. And in fact, the Gemara says that if a person is not wearing his Tefillin at the time of Kriyachma, it's like Eid Sheker, because in Kriyachma he's saying Ukshartim and He's not wearing his tefillin. So if we read the language here, Rabbi Simcha, which you'll see towards the bottom of page 189, he says, das kriyachma, ulispalel Hare olav lechavin lekriyachma litfilo, daito minat tefillin. Now, now stop here. Lefianius Daiti, this question of Rabbeinu Simcha is only to be understood in the light of the Shitas Rambam Ramban that you have to have a positive, constant awareness of Tefillin. And now you're thinking about Kriyachma, which is great, but it's not Tefillin. But if you take Rabbi Yonah's approach, that we don't require a positive awareness, a connection to tefillin, just that we don't allow the negative of, of schok for Kalos Rosh, <clears throat> no, one, <clears throat> no one would argue that, um, that Kriyachma and tefillin is schok for Kalos Rosh. So it seems, Lefiani Yostaiti, that this Rabbi Simcha in his question his very question is predicated on the approach of the Rambam and the Ramban that require a positive awareness of tefillin. But now Rabbi Simcha offers an answer to this question. How could it be that he's reciting Kriyachma and davening at the time that he's wearing his tefillin? It's Hesech Hadas. And his answer is, Osek be mitzvah, potter min mitzvah. That's all we have. So what I thought he was saying was that right now he's involved in Kriyachma and Tefillah, and therefore he's part of Tefillin. So you might argue, okay, he's part of Tefillin, correct? <clears throat> but why is he wearing Tefillin if he's part of Tefillin? Maybe he should take off his Tefillin. But the answer to that is Parshat. Because if we're assuming like Rabbi Yona, then he doesn't have a negative kavanah in, in, in his uh, of schalk for Kals Rosh in his mind when he's reciting Kriyachma. So that's not a problem. Narvas Rabbein Simcha was asking a question according to the Rama and the Ramban, where's your positive awareness of tefillin? And the answer is, I don't have to have a positive awareness of tefillin because I'm part of the mitzvah of tefillin. So that according to Rabbeinu Simcha, the wearing of tefillin, in a sense, is not for the sake of tefillin, but rather to enhance his kriyachma and tefillah. And kriyachma and tefillah, while you're wearing tefillin, upgrades your tefillah and your kriyachma, but it's not a kiyum of tefillin. Now, what I would surmise here is that the Emek Bracha could not accept that pshat in, Rab, in Rabbeinu Simcha. It was impossible for him to imagine that a man is wearing tefillin, he's reciting Kriyachma, and he's part of the mitzvah of tefillin, because he's osik the mitzvah of Kriyachma. 
On the contrary, the Gemara seems to assume that we integrate Kriyach and fill and fill in into one gigantic hole, one kiyum that that uh, that reaches the highest level of of a mitzvah. So, what does Rabbeinu Simcha mean when he says "I'll seek for mitzvah part of in a mitzvah"? Now, here's where the going gets rough. Take a look at Rabbeinu Emek Abracha. He says that what does Rabbeinu Simcha mean when he says "I'll seek mitzvah part of in it"? Potter who means mitzvahs hesech hadas. Did you have that? Again, page 189. And it's in the paragraph that starts Baal Emek Brocha. The next to the last line in that paragraph, it's about 10 lines up from the bottom of the page. And he says, Potter who means mitzvahs hesech hadas. What does that mean? It's gibberish, total gibberish. How can you say he's part of the mitzvah of Hesech Hadas? Was the mitzvah of Hesech Hadas? So I think, honestly, you know, I'll be in touch with Rabbi Mursky when I get back to Yushalai, but I think there's a, is, there's a mistake in the print over here. It should, it, it should be part of me mitzvah's tefillin hamachayeves or haoseres Hesech Hadas. There's no mitzvah of Hesech Hadas, Chas v'sholem. There's an Easter of Hesech Hadas. So what are we saying over here? According to the Emek Bracha, it's impossible to say that he's part from the mitzvah of Tefillin. That's why he reinterprets the words of Rabbeinu Simcha. But yet he's saying he's part from the mitzvah that generates an Easter of Hesech Hadas. What I believe is, is going on here, again, this is just the product of my imagination, is that the Amic Bracha is telling us that there are two parts to the mitzvah of tefillin. And let's assume we're going according to the Ramban and the Rambam. One part of the mitzvah of tefillin is the straightforward mitzvah of tefillin. Hanoch asa tefillin. Al rosho, al, al, al zro. In addition to that, there's a key mitzvah of being aware of the tefillin. So on level number one, it's a maisa hanochas tefillin. And that's the mitzvah of tefillin. You can't tell me that he's part of the mitzvah of tefillin because he's reciting Kriyachman. That doesn't make any sense. First of all, even according to the Klolim of Osik Mitzvah Potter Mitzvah, it doesn't make any sense. Because Osik Mitzvah Potter Mitzvah is only an EF Shalakim Shneer. But leave that out. I don't want to even get, go down that road. Chazal tell us that the, the greatest kiyum of Kabbalah Solmach is Shemayim is, is the combination of Tefillin and Kriyat Shema. Those two mitzvahs together integrate to form one greater whole, which is called Kabbalah Solmach Shemayim. And you reach the highest level of a kiyum. How could Rabbeinu Simcha say that he's part of the mitzvah of tefillin? So therefore, the Emek Bracha is coerced to postulate that there are two parts to the mitzvah of tefillin. One part is the Maisa Nocha, putting on the tefillin, wearing the tefillin, and the other is the, shall we say, the emotional or intellectual awareness of the tefillin, the connecting to the tefillin that the Ramban and the Ramam require. And on that extra level of an awareness of tefillin, and the flip side would be hesichadas from tefillin, here you put. Here we're going to apply the principle of osik b'mitzvah b'mitzvah b'mitzvah. Why? Because now we're talking about a mitzvah sheh b'leiv, a mitzvah sheh b'machshava. So what is the machshava here that you have in mind? L'shem mitzvahs kriyachma, b'shal b'chav kumecha. Or the tefillah, the tefillah, whatever tefillah you're reciting. Whether it's shevach, whether it's bakosha, it's hodo, whatever parts of tefillah you're involved in, that's where your active in, uh, awareness is. And Rabbi Nusimcha is going to say that in that sense, you are forfeiting the mitzvah of tefillah on a machshava level. Because the mitzvah of tefillah requires thinking about the tefillin, a constant awareness of tefillin, to avoid a hesech hadas, 
which according to the Raman and the Ramban in the most extreme formulation means not to be in any way, any way distracted from your thoughts about the tefillin, your connection to tefillin. On that level of machshav, of thought, Rabbi Simcha says you can't have two thoughts in your mind at the same time. It's either Kriya Shema for that mitzvah or tefillah for that mitzvah, or tefillin. So we have a conflict, and now we're going to apply the principle of osik mitzvah part of the mitzvah. But I don't believe for one moment that Rabbeinu Simcha is telling me that at the time of Kriyachmant and, and Tfilah, I'm part of the mitzvah of Tfilin. I'm part of that additional kiyum of Tfilin. Let's call it a Tosefes kiyum of Tfilin, postulated by the Rambam and the Rabban of awareness of Tfilin. That I'm part of. Avalchai of the mitzvah Tfilin, says the Emek Brocha, even according to. Rabbeinu Simcha is obviously is chayiv in the mitzvah tefillin. So you can't take Rabbeinu Simcha at face value and say, well, he's involved in Kriyat Shema and in tefillin, and therefore he's part of the mitzvah tefillin. That's impossible. And therefore now, what the Emek Bracha is going to conclude here, based on his understanding of Rabbeinu Simcha, is that we had a hakira in the First paragraph on this page, Vikan Mokum Lachkar, as to what is this kiyum of the awareness of tefillin and the Isra Hesek Adas. Is it a din in the Maisa mitzvah of tefillin, or is it an additional kiyum on top of the Maisa mitzvah? Right? Let's read the language here. Ha'im, he's talking about the Isra Hesek Adas. Ha'im ume etem hanochas ha tefillin. Oh, that we derive from a kalachomer from tzitz, because there are many, many azkaras in tefillin, there's only one azkara of yudke vavke in, in, in tzitz. And that he calls it tosefes maila of kedushas tefillin. We'll call it a tosefes kiu. And here there's a level of lo yasiach daito man. Now we can add another element into the equation. There may be three alochas. There's one aloha of the kiyum of the Maisa Hanochas tefillin. There's a second aloha of a kiyum of being aware of the tefillin. And that's derived from tzitz. And that's a tosefis kiyum. And then on top of that, there's an iser of schok v'kalos rosh, which even the Ramam and the Ramban could accept. Now, in the first side of his Chakira, the Iser HaHesek Hadas is part of the essence of the mitzvah of tefillin. And without it, if you're not Daito Olov, then your Maisa Mitzvah of Hanukkah's tefillin is completely undermined. But now we get to the Baal Emek Bracha. We see from his insight into Rabbeinu Simcha that you are chayev in the midst of tefillin while you're saying Kriyat Shema. You are a in the midst of tefillin while you're reciting Kriyat Shema, for sure. But you're going to have to forfeit that second kiyum, the Tosefis Kedusha, of being aware of the tefillin because the mind can't be aware of two things at the same time. So if he's focused on Kriyat Shema, the mitzvah of, of, of um, B'Shavuch of Kumecha, or on tefillah, then he's not focused on his tefillin at that point. And in that sense, he has to forfeit that. And here's where Rabbeinu Simcha activates the principle of Osek B'mitzvah Potter. That's what I was able to get out of this Emek Broch. So uh, on the one hand, I'm very excited about it because I worked very hard on this. On the other hand, I think if I want to be honest about it, it undermines a lot of what we discussed about the Ramam and the Ramban. We said that they don't require that every single moment you're thinking about your tefillin. But you have this innate, or shall we say, latent awareness of your tefillin. And if that's what the mitzvah of tefillin is all about, then I don't understand the question of Rabbeinu Simcha, because I could be reciting Kriyachman at the same time I have a latent awareness of, of, of my tefillin. So what was his whole issue over here based on which he was forced into a corner to come up with Osik for Mitzvah Potter? So that question still remains outstanding. Joe? 
just I, the whole thing is it seems so strange that it, what would he say? I mean, the, the mitzvah of tefillin is all day long, really, and only because of gufnaki uh, we don't wear it. According to him, how is this person going, supposed to go through his day at every, if, if he can't, if he, we're saying that he doesn't have the proper kavana for tefillin, when he's saying Shema, which has the Pasuk in it, which you're thinking about, and you're, you're, you're constantly, you're even touching your tefillin, you're involved with it, how, is that, how can a person wear tefillin at any point within the rest so of the day? So I, I believe, Joe, that the answer of Rabbeinu Simcha is exactly what you're looking for, but your point is that the question of Rabbeinu Simcha doesn't make any sense. But let's just fast forward to the answer of Rabbeinu Simcha. Rabbeinu Simcha is telling you that if you're working at Harvey and you're aware of your work, and at the same time you're wearing tefillin, you have a mitzvah of tefillin, but you're part of from another mitzvah of tefillin, which we call the Tosefis Mila of awareness. Because if you're doing sales, or I don't know, I'm, I, you never invited me to your business. So I don't know exactly what you do. I don't know. <laughs> I, I had a better insight into what your father Lashon, did because I used to once in a while say a, a, a class in those comfortable chairs there. Anyway, um, you can't be aware you're filling, you know, like the story I told you about the Barditchava, you know, the guy is, is, is changing the wheel or oiling his wagon and he's still wearing his filling, right? So you can't be aware you're filling. So that's exactly the answer of. Rabbi Nisimcha, the way the Amic Brach is interpreting it, namely that you have to forfeit that kiyum of tefillin, namely of that awareness of tefillin. The only problem is, what was his habamita? What was his kasha? He had a kasha that creates mas hesek adas from tefillin. What does that mean? Is he saying that every second of his of his of his, you know of his wearing tefillin, he says, "Oh, ani odea shan ani makir, ani margish." Showing us it's filling a lot. What, he's going to repeat that every single second and go as he goes by. He can't take a break for a second for kriyachma for tefila. What was he thinking in his havami? That 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 I can't I can't deal with. But at least the way we're interpreting his answer and how he's activating osik b'mitzvah pato b'mitzvah, we're setting up tefillin as two separate kiyumim. One is the hanacha as a mice of mitzvah, and the other is the machshava. This is where. He wants to know how can you distract your machshava for the sake of the kriyachma and forfeit the mitzvah tefillin. And the answer is you're not forfeiting the mitzvah tefillin. You're chayiv in tefillin and you're makayim tefillin. You're forfeiting the second kiyum of tefillin. And in the torso, between that second kiyum of machshava and connection and awareness of tefillin and kriyachma, kriyachma wins out. We'll call it a mitzvah veres. And that mitzvah tefillin for a few for a few minutes is is put on the on the back burners, and I think he would say the same thing about a person who's in the work in the marketplace. That at that moment that he's buying and selling, he's not acutely aware of his tefillin. He is forfeiting that extra tosefis kiyum. But don't undermine the mitzvah tefillin thereby. Don't tell me that he wasn't making the mitzvah tefillin as a ma'aser mitzvah. And the awareness of tefillin is not a condition in the Maisa Mitzvah, the Maisa Mitzvah and the Kiyama Mitzvah. On a basic level, is achieved even if he's not acutely aware of his tefillin. He's distracted with whatever he's doing. Again, we have another halacha of the Isra Hesech Hadas, the way Rabbi Yonah formulates it, and that's Chok and Kalos. Okay, Ad Khan, uh, just, just I wanted to have a hemshek to what we discussed last week. And at this point, we're taking a look at um, Hanukkah. So I, I, I'm assuming that you have uh, basically pages 39 to 48, I think, if that's what, if, if my numbers are correct. Can anybody, uh, you know, certify that? We start at 33. Oh, 33. So one second, maybe my pages are out of order here. I thought I put them in order. Okay, so there's a little bit of a fluke. I don't have the safer with me here in Chutzlaritz. So my pages yeah, are... 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 
39, 40, 41, 42. So we'll, we'll have to work a little bit backwards if it's okay with you, because I don't have the safety here and I could start, you know, printing. It'll take me 10 minutes. So I have page 39. I don't, I don't know exactly. I guess I messed up a little bit. In, in, in. So this is called Halil Kol Shmone. Now the Rambam chooses Hilfus Hanukkah as the place to discuss Halil. Okay, we'll try to uh, see if we can improve on that for a second. Yeah. Very interesting, because when you think about it, if you would have guessed, and the Ram is always, always, always very sensitive as to where he classifies halachas, where would he re- bring down the mitzvah of halel? I would have thought in Shloshis Regalim, right? In the Hilchus Yontif. And part of the mitzvah of Simcha and Yontif is to recite halel. Not only that, the Ramban Shita in his Perish Al Torah is that Halil on Yontif, and even on Rosh Chodesh, at least in the Migdash, whatever, is the Raisa. Obviously, Halil on, on, on Hanukkah is, is the Rabbana. The whole entity of Hanukkah is the Rabbana. So if you take a look at the Brisa in Mesech the Erechin, Daf Yud, which is quoted here on page 39, So there are all told 18 there are high days. This is in Eretz Yisrael. We'll see in Chutzlots after Eir Yontif Shein Shal and we're going to jack up the number to twenty-one. But there are eighteen days in which we read the entire Halal. Interesting, the language of the Brises Gomrim all of us a Halal, and the Sfaradim when they recite Halal Sholem, they make the Bracha Shekitzonim Tzol Sivano Ligmar Es Halal. So we have the eight days of Sukkis. The eight days of Hanukkah, that jacks it up to 16. Then we have Pesach and Atzeres, which is one day each, again in, in Eretz Yisrael. So you go from 16 to 18. And we have to now break new ground on the Mechaev of Hale. What do I mean? If you're talking about Shloshes Saragolim, which accounts for Let's count it up. We have eight because we include Shmini Atzeres. So we have eight plus two days of Yontif is 10. So we have 10 days that are sanctified with Kedush Sayom that generates an Iser Moloch. And then we understand Halil. Halil is precipitated by the Kedush Sayom. But Hanukkah has no Kedush Sayom. There's no Isa Malach on Hanukkah. I mean, there is a minig of Noshim that not to do Malach as long as the Neiros are Dolkin. But that's a minig, has to be understood. But the mitzvah of, of Hanukkah does not generate in any sense an Isa Malach. There's no Kedush Sayom in Hanukkah. If somebody would say, Baruch Ato Hashem, Kaddish Yisrael Vazmanim on Hanukkah, it would be a Baruch Levatola. So what generates the Chi of Halak? And there's only one possible answer, the nest, the miracle. Now, the Ram had a choice. He could have codified the laws of, of Halil within the framework of Kedusha Sayom HaMachayeves or within the framework of Nes HaMachay. And the Ram chose the latter, even though it's only Durabonah. And in all likelihood, what the Rambam is telling us is that whereas the essence of a regel, call it sukkahs, call it shvuahs, call it pesach, is not manifest in halil. Halil is a chiyuv, but it's not the essence. You're talking about kiddush sayom, you're talking about isa malacha, you're talking about simcha. There are many, many dimensions that each, each of the regalim has its own mitzvah and in kodshim, in, in migdash, has its own karmon. Halel fits into the general constellation 
of the various dimensions of a day that has Kedush Sayom. But it's not the essence and it's not the central pro- uh, f- profile of a day that's sanctified with Kedush Sayom. Masha'en came Hanukkah. The very essence of the Takon of Hanukkah has two parts to it. One is Hadlokas Neros and the other is Hale. And perhaps the Ramam holds that the Adlokas Neros is sort of predicated on top of Hale. The basic level, the foundation level of Hanukkah is Hale. And the Ramam opens up Hilchas Hanukkah and he defines these days as you may Hale. So the Ramam chose to codify the laws of Hal in Hilchas Hanukkah because he's talking about the very essence of the day of Hanukkah. Now, in this first paragraph here on page 39, he says the following. There are three conditions for Hal, three conditions that all have to be checked off. Number one, it's got to be called a moed. Number two, it has to have an isim alach. And number three, it has to have its own karma. So, for example, why is it that on Sukkot, every single day requires Hallel, whereas on Pesach, it's only one day of Hallel? The answer is because on Pesach, it's the same carbon that's brought every day, day after day. On Sukkot, Holchin Vipolchin, there's a new, new carbon every single day. Yesterday is not the same as today, and today is not going to be the same as tomorrow. Every day of Sukkot has its own carbon. So whereas Pesach is called a Moed, no less than Sukkot, whereas Pesach has the same Isra Molocha, no less than Sukkot, but it's lacking that third condition for Halel, namely Cholot B'Karban That's the sugya in Erchin in a nutshell. Now on the bottom of page 39, Shmonis Yimei Chanukah, there's no Karman, there's no Moed, there's no Kedush Sayom. Out of the three conditions, it has Zippo, not one of the three conditions. So the Gemara, quoted here on page 40, says the reason for Hal is Mishum Nes. Nes is Mechaev Hal. Now, by the way, as a footnote, Nes is Mechaev Hal for every individual. But we're not talking about individuals, we're talking about Kalal Yisrael, so that the Ness of Hanukkah generates a Chi of Halel that's incumbent upon the entire Tzibur. And now the question is, what is the Ness of Hanukkah? And there are two parts, there are two dimensions. There's the Ness HaNitzachem B'Molchama, which is Rabbi Biyad Miyativ, because based on any military calculations, we would not be able to, to even imagine that the Hashmanoim could defeat the, the, the Greeks. And number two, of course, the Ness of the Pach Hashem. So the Brysa, in Masech the Shabbos, on Daf Chafal from the base, my Hanukkah, the famous Brysa, says that I'll aid, and Rashi says, I'll aid the Ness Kavua. On what miracle of the two miracles were they Kovea Chanak? And the tells us, the Bryson tells us the whole story of the Pacha Shemen. Right? Bodku, Velomotzel, Pach Echad, Shel Shemen, blah, blah, blah. Chos Meshukar Godel, Hebo, Lahad, Yom Echad, and Nasabodnes. Kovu, Vasum, Yom Tov. Now, the Now, I think you would have to agree with me and tell me if you don't that when we compare these two Nisim in terms of their significance, the Pach Hashem doesn't even hold a candle, pardon the pun, to the, mitz- to the Nes of Nitzach and Melchama, which guaranteed the survival of the Jewish people, both physically and spiritually. And yet, Chazal will the, the days of Hanukkah based on the Pach Hashem. 
a very, very famous question. So the Gyoni Allah right now at this point doesn't address this question, but let's say a few words, you know, to, to see if we can calm ourselves down about this. The very concept of a ness is problematic because we believe that God created the world and God is perfect and therefore his creation is perfect. The very fact that there's a need for a, a miracle seems to indicate that God's world, in some sense, is imperfect. A perfect creator creates an imperfect world, and something goes wrong, and therefore he needs to change the laws, change the rules of the game, and bring about a miracle, which is a Shinoi Teva. In fact, the Ramban is very famous for saying that there is no difference between Teva and Ness, in both cases, it's the rots on Hashem, it's the will of God as he supervises and controls the universe. The only difference is that Teva is a Nes Nistar, you don't see it with your eyes, it's not obvious. Whereas Nes is Begolui. Fine. But you see from the Ramban clearly that nature, right? So if, I, um, if I'm holding on to this object and I let go, and the law of gravity says it's going to fall to the ground. That that is a that is a ness. My Rebbe Rav Salvech used to always call it the, that Teva is the Shulchan Aruch of Hakadosh Baruch in the physical world. There's a Shulchan Aruch in the legal world that expresses the demands and the will of God, and then there's a Shulchan Aruch of the natural universe, which also expresses the will of God, and that's Teva. So that if Teva, in a sense, is holy, you know, it's consecrated because it's the will of God, it's the manifestation of God's will, then Shinoi Teva, when God abrogates Teva and undermines Teva, that seems to be an imperfection in the system. You know, like, for example, Chazal say, So the whole creation is really a manifestation of the blueprint of the Torah itself. And obviously the Torah is infinite and it's eternal and it's perfect. So therefore the Bria that was created from the blueprint of the Torah should also be likewise perfect. There's another issue, by the way, which is much more philosophical and very profound. And that is, if we define Ness as Shinu Teva, then we're really undermining all of science. You know, the Torah has a very positive attitude towards science. We don't reject science. And I'm not telling you you have to study science from day till night at the expense of Masech or whatever you're learning. But what I will tell you is that we believe in science. We don't reject science. And all of science is predicated on what's called cause and effect, causality. So A causes B. B is a, an effect of A. And B causes C. And C causes D. And all of nature is one continuous movement of cause and effect. And that's the system of science. The very moment that you introduce a miracle into the equation, you've undermined all of science because now you're telling me that it wasn't A that caused B. Okay, for from a year, I don't think that's a problem because God is the He is the author of nature and He can change nature. You know, if I create something, I can change it. So I don't know that the problem is how could there be in this? That's not a problem, at least for me. But why do you need a ness? Why is there a necessity for a ness? And I believe the answer to that question, and there could only be one answer, is Bechira Chafshis, that God created a world with freedom of choice. God wants us to accept his kingship and to implement the mission of his will. And he gives us a choice. That means we have to choose between good and evil, between right and wrong. 
Trinemis and Sheker. So that itself means that the universe is not perfect. God deliberately created a universe that's not perfect to allow man to sin. Because if man doesn't have the possibility of sin, then there's no Bechir Chavshis. There's an angel in, in, in the heavens. And God didn't create this world for angels. Now, man has freedom of choice and he abuses his freedom of choice. And that's what evil is all about. So at some point in time, as a result of his of man's abuse of his freedom of choice, and he goes down the wrong path. If the evil that he perpetrates becomes so severe that it, it, it puts into danger, into jeopardy, the entire enterprise of creation. So, for example, Rashi says at the beginning of the Chumash, So the purpose of creation is to have a Jewish nation that will glorify and declare the Kvod Shamayim, call Hashem Rativ L'Kvod And if Klal Yisrael is being threatened, if the evil that man perpetrates reaches the point in which the entire future or perpet or the existence of Klal Yisrael is in jeopardy, at that point Hashem steps into the picture and He says, "Ad Khan, you can abuse your freedom of choice, man, but up until a certain point." If you're undermining and destroying my nation, then basically you're undermining the purpose of creation. And that I'm not going to tolerate. That's what Ines is all about. I have Ines for my story one. You have to speak a drop louder, Bobby. I'm sorry. <laughs> you should not have a nest for Umar Sa'ilam. Sometimes it's necessary. To have a nest for Uma Sa'olam only for the purpose of Klal Yisra. It's sort oh, of like sorry. Nevua. Nevua is meant, even if it's for the nations of the world, as a message to Klal Yisra. And then Klal Yisra, in turn, is meant to inspire the Uma Sa'olam. So it works where A goes to B and B goes back to A. But ultimately, it's Klal Yisrael that have to awaken the world to acknowledge God's existence. Now, the question is the following. I understand in Sukkot, for example, why every day of Sukkot requires its own halal. After all, it seems superfluous and unnecessary to thank Hashem for Sukkot every single day of Sukkot. But the answer is every day of Sukkot has its own unique Kedusha Sayon. And that expresses itself in the karma. And that's why Chalukim the karma Oseyam, the Gemara establishes in Erechit, is a precondition to Halel. On Pesach, it's one entity of Kedusha Sayon from beginning to the end. And there's one Halel for all those seven days of Pesach. Now, if you missed it on the first day, so you recite how on the second day, etc., etc., till Shkia on the seventh day. But there's one how for the entire entity of Pesach, because every day is just a duplicate of the day that came before, the day comes after it, not so in Sukkot. But then we get to Hanukkah. And although there's no karma on Hanukkah, we could expect on Hanukkah that one recitation of Halal should cover all eight days of Hanukkah. Why does every day generate a new chiv of halal? Where's the chalukim? Again, not the carbon oseim, but some sort of chalukah. And here's where we have to introduce base hillel. Mosif aholech. Now again, mosif aholech literally means that we add another candle, but it's more than that. Because mosif aholech on that level is just a heder mitzvah. And the basic mitzvah is Ner Yishu Besa. But the conceptual framework for Mosef Aholich is what we call his godless hanes, meaning there's a process by which the nest becomes greater and greater with each day. Every day we look at the Pach Hashemen and we wonder, would that Pach Hashemen last for another day? And each day is a new miracle and generates its own Chi of Hal. But then we get back to the other question. Well, 
shouldn't we be reciting Hal over the Nitzachan in the Milchama? The problem with the Nitzachan in Milchama is that the military experts, Kaviyochel, have written treatises about how the glorious brothers were able to defeat the mighty Yavanin. And they'll talk about, you know, uh, you know, terrorism and all this kind of stuff about how you, you know, you know, like, for example, what is it, 30 terrorists brought America down to its feet, right? How many people perished? Was it 3,000? I don't remember the exact number, but close. I'm not far off. Over two for sure. So the glorious Chashmonoim uh, were able to win. So it, it's what you call a Nes Nistar. We need a Nes Nigla. Why do we need a Nes Nigla? The Nes Nigla is going to serve a totally different purpose. We're not perpetuating the existence of the nation of Israel, but rather we're perpetuating the people of Israel, not as a nation amongst the nations, but as a unique nation. Of Bishvil Yisrael Shenikroim Rashis, that this nation justifies the entire enterprise of creation by the divine being. And for that, we need a different kind of a miracle. We need an obvious miracle that changes nature, that clearly, undoubtedly indicates God's involvement with the Jewish people. And of course, you have the famous Kasha of the Nodabi Yehuda, who lived 300 years ago. He asked the Kasha, well, why do we commemorate the, the, the Shemen in the menorah? What about Yayin Linesachim? What about Solis Lemincha? I mean, there were many dimensions of the Avodos Amigdos that the Greeks contaminated. And now we did a whole Tara process and we reproduced Solis Lemincha, Bitara, and Yayin Linesachim Bitara. Now, I don't know if the Nodavihud is absolutely convinced that there were miracles involved in the Nisachim and the Menachas. I don't know. But what I do know is that the Nodavihud is going to claim that there's something very special about the menorah. And the miracle of the menorah, more than any other dimension of Avodah Space Hamigdash, is going to be indicative of God's intervention in history by changing the laws of nature for the benefit of a unique nation on a spiritual level. There's something about the menorah more than any other aspect of Avodos HaMikdash that indicates the unique contribution of the Jewish people. As the Gemara says in Mesech the Menachas, the Gemara says, why does Hashem need us to light the menorah? What was the base HaMikdash is dark? You know, they didn't have electricity in those days, right? So, La'ora Hutzara, God needs our or Balos Chasaneros, El Mul Pnea Menor Iru. And the Gemara says, no. That R is the R of the Ner HaMaravi. The Ner HaMaravi was the first Ner to be lit and the last ne'er to extinguish. And yet, the kamus, the volume of oil that was placed in the ne'er marav, was exactly identical to that of the other ne'eros. And what was the purpose of this miracle, Chazal tell us? That it's to create the R, that clarity of vision about Klal Yisrael. That hashchi edus hili Yisrael, shashchi neshar Yisrael. So there's a relationship between Klal Yisrael and Shechina that defines us as a unique nation. And again, the nations of the world will deny it. But you know where I, they could, for my part, gay Buddha's eye, they could go fly a kite. But we believe that Klal Yisrael is a unique nation that justifies the entire purpose of creation. The whole agenda of the divine being was for Klal Yisrael. And that Shechina, that manifests itself in the great miracle of the Ner Menorah is going to make it obvious that we are a special nation, not just God. You know, God could perpetuate the existence of any nation. But in the case of Kali Yisrael, it's because Bereshis Baral Akim, this nation justifies the entire purpose of creation. 
and we have no parallel in the Beis Hamikdash, not in the Menachos, not in the Nesachim. It's the Shemen of the Menorah. And in fact, the Ramam opens up Hilchas Chanukah with two words. You may remember that I discussed this with you in the past. The Bayis Sheni, and the Ramam says you must know that this miracle took place during Bayis Sheni. Honestly, why do I have to know that? Do I really know the difference between Bayis Rish and Bayis Sheni? Unfortunately, how many Yidden there are that I'm talking about, even, you know, Dafyomi Yidden. How many of them know the difference between Bayis Rish and Bayis Sheni? All right, it's tucked away in the Gemara and Yuma and a different miracle, blah, blah, blah. And if you ask me which Bayis was more beautiful, more glorious, it's certainly Bayis Rishon. So why does the Ram have to emphasize Bayis Sheni? But the answer is, Dafka during the period of Bayis Sheni, when there was so much Isyavnus and there was so much inner fighting and so many, you know, reform movements, if you will, you know, all these sects uh, that broke away from the Prussian, that we desperately needed a nest to indicate that we have the Shechina, that we are a unique people. And for that, we needed the miracle of the Pach Hashem. Obviously, once we have the miracle of Pach Hashem, that sheds a light on the miracle of the Nes HaNitzachin of Rabbi Miyad Miyatim. And basically, Rabbi Miyad Miyatim is also a Nes Nigla, but officially it's a Nes Nistar, because you could interpret it within the framework of natural, of natural history. So he writes here, in the name of Tosus and Tainus, this is in the middle of page 40, He says, Yontif Rishon who Gomer Esa Halil, Abel Shmoni Mehal Lo, Mishum Sheene Domel Chanakul Sukkis. See here, Tosus added Chanaka. Shechanaka Dino Ligmara Halil. Why? Why is every day of the eight days of Halil, Machayev Egmar Halil, eight days of Chanaka? Shekol Ashmoni Yomim Hoyu Nes Hanesmis Gadel. The Nes. Increase. There was an increment from one day to the other. Now, I always wondered, you know, in Sphere Saomer, if you miss the first day, you're in trouble. And even the Gaonim who say that if you skip the day, you're Yotze, but that's on the condition that you got the first day. So, what would be a person who missed the first day of Hanukkah? It almost happened to me on this trip. And I have a Talmud who asked me this question. You know, he's 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 not going to make it for because he's traveling to Eretz Yisrael. He's not going to make it on time for Lucas Neris. He's going to actually miss a day. So he asked me if he could light an electric light on the plane. You know, they have these battery operated. Uh, what are they called? Uh, it has a name. Whatever it is. Anyway. Flashlight or a flashlight? Uh, or? No, I, it's not a flashlight. It's like, it starts with a P. I forgot what it's called. Anyway, so I told him I don't believe that that would be meaningful, in my humble opinion. Rashi, in Mesechta Shabbos, in the Sugi of Hanukkah, the Gemara says that a raw near Hanukkah Mavarech, and the Gemara says he makes the Baruch Hashanah and Nisim. So Rashi asks the question, well, he answers it at least, he doesn't ask it, why, why is he making a bracha? Because he sees Yenem's Hanukkah. What about his own Hanukkah? So obviously Rashi has to go down the line that he is not able to fulfill his mitzvah of Hanukkah. All he does is see someone else's Ner Hanukkah. So Rashi asks, what's, what's the case? What's the scenario? Is he so poor that he can't afford? I mean, the Ram says you have to sell the shirt off your back for Hanukkah. So Rashi answers, Holech Bisfina. He's on a boat. When the boat gets close to the shore, or before the boat departs from the shore, he can see somebody's near Hanukkah, and he's going to make the Brocha Shasa Nisan. Because there are two Kiyumim in Hanukkah, as I heard from my Rebbe a dozen times. Number one, it's the Maisad Lokan. Number two, it's the Re'iyah. 
That's why a blind person never has a problem with Ner Hanuk. But I think the Rav would probably say, again, I'm not poskening, but uh, he should make the first bracha, not the second bracha. Or maybe he could make the second bracha because he affords, he makes it possible for others to see the Ner Hanuk, whatever it is. But there's a Kiyam Re'iya in Ner Hanuk. And that's a halachic concept, not a Hasidic concept. It's also true of Hasidus, you know, to see the Ner Hanuk. So if that be the case, that Rashi's example of someone who did not light Ner Hanuk is because he was a Holech Bisfina. I believe the same thing would apply to an airplane. I mean, sorry, I'm not, I'm not here to pass him. But an airplane is like a uh, is like a ship. It's it's moving, it's in motion. And a bias has to be something stationary. I don't have to own the bias. Again, you have to go into the laws of Achsanoi. For example, let's say you're in a hotel room on Hanukkah. Now, let's assume you could light, they'll allow you, I don't know what the rules are, to light an air Hanukkah in a hotel room. So you'll say, well, it's not my bias. So there are two answers to that question. One answer is because you're paying, you know, you're paying for the night, so no one could take that hotel room away from you. So you have bias. That's called Schirus, Schirus Canyon. But I don't believe you need that answer. I don't think you have to own the bias. You don't have to make a Kenyan on the bias. If you were going to a bias of Hefker, Almanas Shalom Lizkos, you would still be Chayv V'ner Chanek. There's no Tanai of Beishol like there is L'Katem Lachem and Lulav. It's got to be Lachem. So it's got to be a bias. It's got to be something stationary. It's got to be, you know, Holche Ashuk will see your Ner Chanek, or could see your Ner Chanek. Now, who could see your Ner Chanek in, in, in an airplane? So you told me, oh, I'm being referred in the nest to those who are inside the airplane. Well, and so, so what is it? We're all part of one bias. I don't, I don't know if there is such a halacha. Because if that be the case, and if on an airplane we're all part of one bias, then the same thing should apply to a sfina. And that's the case that Rashi gives where he was not Makayim the mitzvah of Ner Chanak. He just has a kiyam re'ia when he sees someone else's Ner Chanak. So he says, Sukkot is kol yom v'yom yontif atzmo because of the different karbonos. But Pesach is the same identical karbon, same identical kedusha yom and moed, and therefore one halal is suffice is sufficient for the entire. Now he quotes the Avudra. Hatam she gomer is a halal kol shmonis yimei chanaka v'tisha simei achag asukis. Right, so he's in Chutzlaretz. So he has a ninth day of Sukkot, which is what we call Simchas Torah. Every day of Hanukkah has a Chidush to it. Shehu ner echad Yosef. I guess according to Beit it would be ner echad Pachos. Ushmonis yimei Hanukkah chalukim I'm sorry, it's me. Sukkot chalukim kornosim. All right, same idea. Now, in the brisa of my Hanukkah, as he points out here on page forty-one, the nusach is l'shana acheres kavum v'osum yomim tovim b'hal v'hodon. So he's bothered by what I would consider a secondary diuk, a secondary problem, namely. Why does it say us um? Us um is in the plural. It should have said Lashana Kheras Kavi Asu Yomtov Shmonas Yom. And the answer is that if it would have said in the Brysa Kov that Lashana Kheras Asu Yomtov, it would imply. 
that there's only one day of Yontif. It may be a long day that's made up of eight times 24 hours, but primarily it's one day. By saying Asa'um in the plural, it indicates that each day was a separate Kvius of a Yontif. And that expresses itself in its, that it generates a Chiyav Hala. But I thought that the most problematic part of the statement of the Brisa is Lashon HaCheres. What does that mean, Lashon HaCheres? It's almost as if they waited and delayed this Takana to be covered in the days of Hanukkah. So here we have an amazing Chiddush of the Advani Nezer, of the Sokach of it. He believes that Lashon HaCheres doesn't mean the next year, but a different year. Which year? He says the year of the Churban Abayas. Now, mind you, the base make the base on Migdash stood for two centuries after the Nes of Hanukkah. But how long was Bayashani? It was 420, I think. So this is somewhere in the middle. Hanukkah takes place in the middle of Bayashani. And the Avdinesa says the Takana of Hanukkah, of Ner Hanukkah, was made after the Khurma. So I heard once from my Rebbe, what is he talking about? And he suggested that the mitzvah of Ner Hanukkah, according to the Avdinesa interpretation of this price, is very similar to the mitzvah of Lulav Kol Shiva, the Takana of Rabbi Yochanan and Zakai, or Hill Sheet about Korech, or perhaps for your soul. All these are Zechel and Migdash. Now, as long as the Migdash is standing, we don't have a mitzvah of Zechel and Migdash. After its destruction, then we have to make a Zechel. So if that be the case, then we understand that Lashon HaCheres, in the light of the Avinesa, means they waited for the Churban. Now, once they waited for the Churban, now there's no longer a Ner Shem and Migdash. Now they have to replace the Ner Shem and Migdash. And they do so through the mitzvah of Ner Shal Hanukkah. That's an amazing chiddush. But the bottom line for our purposes, Asa'um, that every single day of Hanukkah was established as a yontif unto itself. The nest becomes greater with every passing day. And therefore there's a chi of Halel on every single day of Hanukkah. And we'll 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 conclude because it's getting late here with the end of this paragraph that starts with Berif, and he writes that So Shechion is only on the first. So he writes that Birchas Shechion Ola Al Zman Hanukkah. There's something called Zman Hanukkah, which is an integration of all eight days into one indivisible entity. But Shasanisim is on each day unto itself. Not like Shekhi It's for the ness of that day, which is not identical to the ness of the previous day. The Kevet Shai Ness Nishadish B'Chol Yom, L'Fichuch Mavarchim, Kol Yom, we recite Shasa Nisim, eight days on a daily, on a daily basis. All right, so let me take this opportunity to wish you a Freilich and Chanukah and the Mirz Hashem You'll let me know about next Wednesday. I imagine you'll have to start a little later because maybe because of Halil. But how long does Hal take? We we start earlier. Oh, so then uh, if it's if it's okay with you, then you know, I mean, I'm gonna have to work it out with my Nair Hanukkah, if you know what I mean. But uh, okay then. Yeah, thank you very much, Rev. Shkur, thank you so much. Right. And uh, wish me an Asiyat Tova. Asiyat Tova. Yeah, thank you so much.